Hey, everybody. Welcome into episode 162 of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. My guest on the show today is Dr. Ryan Donlan. Uh, Dr. Donlan is a professor at Indiana State University in the Department of Educational Leadership. And honestly, Ryan is somebody that I've had a really good opportunity to get to know over the course of the last year. Ryan and I co-presented and co-keynoted at a conference in Oregon almost a year ago, and we've built a really good friendship since that point in time. He's one of the more entertaining individuals that I've ever come across. I don't know that I laugh as much uh, around almost anybody else as I do when I'm with Ryan Donlan. Uh, just an absolutely hilarious individual. But not only that, he's a really intelligent individual. And Ryan has really pushed in that space around how do we help educators to not only be the best they can be, but to keep them in education. Uh, Ryan's actually written a handful of books, um, and we're going to talk about all of them in this particular episode, and, and, but not specifically about the books, but just really about how do we how do we support first assistant principals, you know, and all those other duties as a side that come to the assistant principal. We're going to talk about a, a book that he did in partnership with someone else around ensuring that our teachers really feel like they matter. And then we're going to talk about his newest project, uh, which is a book called Uncommon Sense for New Teachers. A good beginning is half the work. And Ryan has just got some really exciting, interesting, simple ways for us to ensure that our new teachers have an opportunity to hit the ground running, to feel like they've gotten off to a good start, and especially this time of year, they're just a you know they're just a month or two into their career. How do you, as the leader, ensure that they're getting the support and the help that they need? And Ryan's got a lot of great strategies that he's going to share today in this particular episode. I know you're going to love it. I know you're going to have a whole lot of fun, folks. So stick around. You're going to get the whole thing right after this. Hello, leaders. This is Darren Pepper, host of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Are you ready to take your leadership and your team to the next level? As a leadership coach and speaker, I'm passionate about helping school leaders and leadership teams like yours gain clarity and walk confidently in your purpose. In today's fast-paced educational environment, it's easy to get lost in the noise. My mission is to help you cut through the noise and focus on what truly matters, building positive culture, leading with intention, and making decisions that align with your core values. Whether you're looking for a keynote address, a hands-on workshop, or a transformative leadership retreat, I tailor every experience to meet the unique needs of your team. I believe that when leaders are clear about their purpose, they can lead more authentically and create a ripple effect that impacts every level of the organization. If you're ready to inspire your team, foster deeper connections, and drive meaningful change, I'd love to work with you. Let's make your next event more than just another meeting. Let's make it a turning point for your leadership journey. Visit roadtoawesome.net or reach out directly to book me today. Together, we can lead with clarity and with purpose. For those of you who have been following the show for quite some time, you know that I certainly enjoy writing. I write a blog every single week. I've done a couple of books. I'm working on two books right now. And I consider myself, you know, quite quite an accomplished writer. And then I sit down with someone like my guest on the show today, Ryan Donlan, and I'm just I'm humbled at the incredible works that some writers can do. And and certainly Ryan Donlan is one of those people. He's got another new book that just came out. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about a couple of his other books. We'll talk about some of the work that he does uh, through Indiana State University and just all kinds of wonderful stuff. I'm sure we'll probably go off the rails a little bit and have a little bit of fun and have some laughs and that kind of stuff. But I'm super excited today to welcome Ryan Donlan into the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. So Ryan, thanks so much for joining me today, man. Oh, Darren, thank you. This is going to be a blast. Um, just, I, I'm just such an admirer of all you represent. And so to be be on the show with you today, it is a slice of heaven. Thanks so much for having me. A slice of heaven. I love That's that. That's a slice That's... of heaven. A slice of heaven. I don't know that I've heard that one before. That's well done. So um, 
Ryan, let's let's do this really, really okay. quick. Just kind of give a little bit of orientation maybe to the listeners or the the viewers of the show who don't necessarily know who Ryan Donlin is or mm -hmm. some of the great work that you do. Just give them a little slice of Ryan Donlin. Oh, thanks, Darren. Well, Ryan Donlin, I spent 20 years in P12 education as a teacher, as a leader of all different flavors. And uh, now for the past, gosh, close to 13 or 14, I've been working as a teacher of leaders. Uh, Indiana State University Department of Educational Leadership, where I like to say I read, I write, I hang around smart people, the folks running our schools. That's who I hang around. And in doing that, I have the opportunity to do a lot of writing, love to write books, love to travel around the country and beyond just coaching folks up on how to be great leaders and servants and stewards and uh, a lot of professional development. I have a humbling opportunity to meet some of the greatest folks who are championing kids and teachers in communities. And it's just a blessing. Darren, I can't believe I get paid for doing what I'm doing. Um, husband, father, oh gosh, got a wonderful wife. I married up, by the way. A couple of great kids, both here at Indiana State University. And uh, um, gosh, it life's good. Life is really good. Uh, for sure. And so, you know, you and I actually had the opportunity to to share a space for a couple of days in Oregon. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the, yeah. In the fall of, of 2023, um, yep. our mutual friend Eric Nichols brought us out to the Wide Open Spaces Conference. Such such an interesting and, and, and inspiring time, to be honest with you, you know, being right there on the Deschutes River with, yeah. you know, a whole bunch of different, you know, especially in that particular case. All of those educators are rural educators. So, I mean, they're working in, you know, the bulk of our schools across the yeah. country, honestly, are rural schools. And so to have the opportunity to pour into some rural educators and, and to work shoulder to shoulder with you for a couple of days was was a lot of fun. Um, I guess, you know, before before we start talking about all the books and that kind of stuff, <laughs> it was a treat. I don't know. Let's maybe treat. just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, we arrived there the night before and they, the mentors of the, the conference, the, the facilitators were putting their things together. We got to hang out. We got to learn from them. And, um, it was sort of a maker space. We got to we got to work with them to create what we were going to be doing together over the next couple of days. And then we left it in Eric's hands. We trusted him to slot us in as he wanted to do it. You'd do some things. I'd do some things. I'll tell you, we had a ball when we were doing things together. And yeah, uh, it, was, sure. it was a great event. Those folks are powerful out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Big shout out to to Eric Nichols out there yes. in Oregon. A whole whole heck of a lot of fun. Oh so um, let, let, let's let's go a little bit further um, into your okay. journey. So you talked about, you know, being being in, uh, you know, pre through 12th yes. education for a while and then at a point in time left, you know, from from this role that from the role that you were in um, as, as a leader to now go and pour into leaders. Uh, right. Talk a little bit about what, I don't know, what, what was the pull? Mm -hmm. What was the, the, the tug, the tap on the shoulder, whatever it was that led you to move from one space into another. And, yeah. and I don't know, maybe what, what have you learned in that space versus well, where I'll you were tell before? You, yeah, it, it was, it was difficult to uh, imagine myself leaving P12 uh, let alone to leave teaching. I I never stopped, never to this day have stopped being a teacher. So I was a classroom teacher for a while. And then as I, I may share in a little while, I moved into an assistant principalship, but I leveraged the power and the, the opportunity as an assistant principal from the mind and heart of a teacher. Uh, Discipline is a teachable moment was just one of those things. And then principalships and uh, capped off my career in P12 as, as a superintendent. But what happened along the way is I never stopped teaching and serving with a variety of hats in different roles because um, I made sure that my schools were right sized so I could wear many hats. Well, superintendent, I was also principaling and assistant principaling and, and and even being the custodian at times. It was just one of those awesome opportunities. And then I I was I was doing what we do. We go and collect higher uh, higher degrees, graduate degrees. And um, I was nearing the end of my doctorate, and I had the opportunity to uh, uh, to do an internship right in the Department of Educational Leadership in my university. 
and uh, fell in love with the role, the, the, the opportunity to teach leaders how to make in a, a, a wider and deeper influence in the schools and the communities that they work. And I, I found out Darren, I was sort of good at it. And, and um, it felt good. And so I, I'm telling you, I was going along. I had a nine member board. I'd been there 11 years. I had a five year rollover contract and this place was awesome. And uh, I started talking to my board president. I said, I, I'm, I'm feeling compelled. I'm feeling called to do something else, to take up another challenge. And, and he worked with me and we shared with the board over the uh, quite some time that I had these other goals. And so we worked on a transition plan. Um, I interviewed a small number of universities and the folks at Indiana State University, I'm telling you, when you have folks who are greeting you, I mean, Todd Whitaker and his wife, Beth, are driving me back to the airport after my day-long interview. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. That's true. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Steve Grunert, our, our, our hero in school culture, uh, he, was, he was the department chair doing the hiring. Uh, Mary Howard Hamilton doing the search chairing and things like that, or co-chairing with Terry McDaniel. I fell in love with the folks, and I, I had some conversations with my wife and a lot of soul searching because, again, you know, I wasn't running from anything. I was loving P12 and the, the opportunity presented itself. I got, I got the call from an amazing Dean Brad Balch and uh, move, got a couple of U-Hauls and moved my family to Terre Haute, Indiana from beautiful mid Michigan. And uh, kids uh, started in first and second grade and they've been through the public schools here locally. And now they're living their best college lives on campus at Indiana state. Uh, and that's how it happened. Uh, but difficult decision to make. Oh my God! Well, I was, I was crying like you wouldn't believe when I was announcing it to to my school and my kids and my students and my teachers. It was, um, it, but it was because it it was so meaningful. There's there's no life like the life of an educator, and so I'm doing the same type of stuff. I'm just in a different setting with a different footprint. But I'd like to think that I'm only as good as my my next day's best work. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I love that. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that story because, oh. um, you know, it's, it's always interesting, you know, people don't necessarily know what it is that, you know, goes into the decision-making process to move from, from one thing that you're doing to another. Right. And, oh. you know, I mean, I, often, you know, people, you know, who, who know that I no longer am in a public school every single day, um, right. assume that I have retired. I have not retired. I am neither <laughs> old enough nor wealthy enough to be retired, nor do I have any intention of being right. retired. I mean, maybe somewhere down the road, right? Um, right. But no, you are you the know, busiest guy on the balcony yeah. that I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's just, it's, it's interesting, right? Just to, to yeah. kind of know a little bit more about other people's stories. So I appreciate you sharing that. And, and, and I think it, it leads us to a nice transition to, uh, there, there's three different books of yours that I want to talk about. And, and not necessarily specifically the book, but rather kind of the work that, that, that went into those and, and the impact that you, you know, have been able to have and, and hope to continue to have with those. And it, the first one really was, was geared towards those early career leaders, right? And those are the ones yes. who I work with the most. You know how much, how much I love supporting those early career leaders, whether they're APs or principals or even, you know, uh, early career superintendents. But but the book, other dude, all other duties as assigned. And yeah. I, I fell in love with this one just from the title alone, because oh. there's, there's just so much to be said for, you know, yeah, that all other duties as assigned and oh. everything that goes with the phrase. So l let's, let's talk a little bit about maybe the genesis of that project. Oh, that's well, first of all, the title's genius, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And I say that having, I, I deserve zero credit because I presented the antithesis. So now get ready for this. Get ready for this. <laughs> I wanted to call it Assistant Principal University. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh God, he's been in the ivory tower now for too long. And, but I, I always, I, I did. I wanted to write in this book called Assistant Principal University because I, I thought of the assistant principal's role. I press rewind on my own life, but I, I'm all over the place meeting a ton of assistant principals. And they are life's heroes. I mean, their curriculum is called life and, and their instruction yeah. is called a daily difference on behalf of this wonderful 
person who's coming to them oftentimes on their not so best day. Right. So yeah. I still remember the names and the faces and the trials and the tribulations of all the kids and families and, and even staff that I helped. And I wanted to write about it. And I, I, I had this opportunity. I right, right when the world was coming to crash in in about March of 2020, right? So I call up uh, Douglas Reif from Solution Tree, the president, and I said, I've been wanting to write this book, Assistant Principal University, for like a million years. And he and I talked about it. I submitted a proposal. And then one of the reviewers said, My goodness, I like this stuff, but you really should call it All Other Duties as a Sign. So, totally a Solution Tree reviewer was genius. I was clueless, yeah. right? I, I, but I had good stuff. And what I found is that in consulting, I don't even know how many thought leaders and experts and stuff. And then putting together, I had a million ideas. I'm telling you, the ideas, the strategies in this book work, and they work every time done well. I have nearly 60 how-tos for, for assistant principals, leveraging discipline as a teachable moment, doing difference differently school data from A to Z and, and things like that, that, uh, that are powerful. And as I work with assistant principal groups and leverage this resource travel in the country, I think sometimes, Darren, I learn more from them than they do for, from me, mm -hmm. but it is a phenomenal read. And again, Solution Tree, one of their litmus tests is for every why and what, we want three hows in this. In fact, I'll hold it up here for those watching. This is the book and look at this little guy over here. Ah, there he is. And he's got that stack of things to do because he's got all other duties as assigned. And uh, then the moment one student leaves the office, the next one comes in. And uh, what you're going to do next with that child can um, make a huge impact on their lives. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think I, I like how you said that about the assistant principals. They truly are heroes. And they are. There's, there's so much that goes into the role. And I think most, not all, but most assistant principals, when they go into that role, it's they see it as a stepping stone. This is an opportunity yeah. to to learn and to grow to to step into that next piece, which maybe that's a right. building principal role. Certainly, that was that was my path, and that's that's the path for so many. But what what I appreciate about that, and and I appreciate about all the different strategies there, is that it's an opportunity to kind of take a step back and think about you know, what are the things that you're learning as an assistant principal? Oh. I mean, yes, it is a stepping stone, right? It is a move from here to here if that's what I choose for it to right. be. Right. But it's it's also this incredible opportunity, opportunity to learn and yeah. to understand how your impact changes when you go from being in a classroom to being mm -hmm. in, you know, in an assistant principal role. So, Maybe maybe just take one of the strategies okay. that's in there and let's let's just talk about it just a little bit. Maybe give us, I don't know, give us a little flavor of of that one and let's kind of banter on it. Okay, well, I'll just give you one that has to do with strategy for the adults. Okay, because I have strategies for um, students, I have strategies for staff, and I have strategies for you as an assistant principal in there in each chapter. It's like parallel in each chapter. And so let's let's just talk about um a strategy for the adults. And so as I go hither and yon, I talk to assistant principals because I have this thing that if three things were present in every classroom, the traffic to the assistant principal's office would be cut by between 90 and 100 percent. And those three things, and all you got to do is do these three things and your traffic of office referrals goes down by 90 to 100 percent. And it's to have every kid experience interest, engagement, and success. I mean, students, their needs are small. All they got to do is be interested, engaged, and successful. Yeah. Why the heck would anybody want to leave a classroom, let alone disrupt it, right? And so I not only talked to the adults about that, but I talked to the kids about, hey, if you are having an adult that you're disconnecting with, basically you got to teach them how to speak your language, right? Because, you know, teachers are wonderful, but they're not mind readers. So just ask for what you want and share what you need as a student. And, and my goodness, if you, if you deliver on interest, engagement, and success, and here's another one too. As teachers, um, I, do, I do this in a lot of my writings, why don't we just plan that discipline will be the teachable moment? Because every single time it's like a flashing light that the, that the student needs something. So look at the flashing light, 
determine what they need, and then turn that moment into one where they're interested, where they're engaged, and when they're successful. And then I have another one that I share that's called Doorways of Dignity in the book. Okay, so we know kids come into our office, but it is so critical, Darren, what happens when kids walk out of our office, what we say, what we do, what they experience, because invariably in many schools, there's a peanut gallery of other kids waiting to see you as an assistant principal. And then there's those onlookers who are milling about the office, the schools, you know, administrative assistants, secretaries. Does each child leave your office with dignity? And if it's a real heavy situation, do you have an exit plan so that they don't have to walk past others when they have a lack of dignity? And so these are ways of just ways of being as an ethical human being. And those are a few of those things that I teach. I mean, there's 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 nearly 60 more, but are you doing this in the classroom? And are you doing this as an assistant principal? And even as a child, if curriculum really is life, and if instruction is really making a daily difference, we need to be teaching the, the students how and under what conditions do you address the teacher when you go back because you've just had an awkward moment in that class. And the first five seconds on the way back in can either be awkward or less than awkward based on what you teach that student to do exactly when they walk back into the class. That's why I love being an assistant principal because, you know, th th that stuff is great. And I'll tell you again, if done well, it works every time. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it gets back to it gets back to relationships. It gets back to remembering that we're in the we're in the people business, right? I mean, totally, we're, we are totally. about people. And yes. uh, I really, in particular, what, uh, of everything you just said, all of it was so, so very good. But I really love, you know, making sure that the child has an opportunity. And, and this is probably true also with the adults, too, right? Oh, yeah. That they yep. have the opportunity to leave your office with dignity. And if yeah. not, what is the exit plan to to allow for that to happen so they don't have to uh, right. essentially run the gauntlet on the way out of the office you know, with with everybody else who's there for all the the myriad reasons that people are in the office. In addition to the the, the remaining nine kids who are waiting to see you, you know, <laughs> right. parents, office staff, teachers who are on prep, on and on and on and on. I, I just I really love that. I think that's I think that's so huge. And and it's uh, as you're talking, I mean, I, I in my mind's eye, I couldn't I could see the office right yeah. outside of my door when I was yep. the assistant principal in charge of discipline and attendance. And, yeah. you know, that, that exit for a kid, mm -hmm. that how the kid walks out, right. man, what an impactful piece right there. So yeah, folks, I, I, I mean, like, seriously, you might want to just hit rewind and listen to that piece again, because it mm -hmm. was just that, that good. I love that so much. Um, mm -hmm. So, let's let's do this there's so much i want to talk about and time is just like <laughs> flying on us here so yeah. um let, let's let's jump forward um i said i wanted to talk about three of your of your projects um ensuring teachers matter so oh. uh, as as we were just saying you know with uh with whether it's a student or an adult because we all know we have those conversations with 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 our teachers you know mm -hmm. with our employees that aren't always going to go well Right. You know, maybe right. there's a, a you know, a, a employee discipline situation or something like that. And certainly we want to treat them with dignity, too. Um, I'll use that to transition to ensuring teachers matter mm -hmm. was was the new book um, until, until right. now. You're, you're brand new and that has just released. But um, when, when you and I were together, uh, ensuring teachers matter had just uh, released fairly recently. Uh, so oh, yeah. talk about talk about that project a little bit and what what led you to to wanting to do that. Oh, this one's a this one's a keeper right here. I'm again for those listening. I'm holding up a copy of the book primarily because I want to show you that I am not first author on this. One of my former students, my former PhD student, I I, I chaired Shelley Wilfong's dissertation. Doctor now Shelley Wilfong, and we were we were chatting one day. She had an interest in. Um, uh, doing something about teacher retention in our profession. And so through some really good conversations, I joke with folks, I say, I get to teach in the gifted and talented end of the PhD program, right? Because like Shelly's right there. And I shared a concept with her called mattering. 
because I had learned about that since coming to the university and hasn't been talked about in K-12 education much, but yes, in higher education, nursing, social work, other professions, about this thing called mattering and not the type of mattering that is like you matter because you're a teacher making a difference for kids or whatever. It's about mattering to the other adults with whom you work. And I thought back and Shelly then did research with thousands of teachers and did a statistical factor analysis, some real high octane stuff and discovered Shelly, Dr. Shelly Wilfong discovered with me, me riding shotgun as her chair, that there are foundational for the adults in the building. And there are eight foundational elements of mattering. And there, there are things like, um, you know, job crafting. And yes, compensation is one of them. Authenticity, flow, and some other things that you can find on, uh, you know, Shelley's website or certainly in our book with Solution Tree uh, that uh, make a powerful difference. And for years and years and years, I have been saying that if we're going to be about the kids most, we got to be about the adults first. It's just like an oxygen mask in an airplane thing. You know, the oxygen mask falls in the event of cabin depressurization. Put it on yourself before the one that you're caregiving next to. Same principle. And then <laughs> Shelly found me when I was on sabbatical, fair and square. And she, she said, Ryan, we're, we got to follow this up. So we did research with thousands and thousands of other teachers. And, you know, we found eye popping relationships between this mattering to the other adults in the building, having a posse, having a team, a group, being tight, having work friends, eye popping to positive school culture, perspectives on school change, climate, organizational health, and Darren, the big one, collective teacher efficacy. The John, Hattie, Jenny, Donahue, big one that toggles yeah. between number one and three, I think, on their list every year. Yeah. Mattering and collective teacher efficacy. So we wrote a book. And again, much to much to the uh, uh, delight of Solution Tree, we got just a ton of hows. What can teachers do to leverage mattering among teachers? What can principals do to leverage mattering? Because, again, it's where to focus first so that students matter most. Uh, a big shout out to my, I, I, I say that I'm Robin to her Batman any day, uh, but uh, Dr. Shelley Wilfong is legit on this. And I'm, I'm just so pleased that she had me along for this book. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. And it, it, it leads me to this question and, and this might ultimately take us to, uh, though it will ultimately take us to your third book, your new book. But okay. I'm curious when, when we look at that concept and we talk about mattering to the other adults in the building, mm -hmm. I hear frequently, you know, with, with all my work around the country that, you know, the newest generation of teachers, this, this, you know, generation of early twenties. Uh, I mean, I have a daughter who's in that, that generation, she's not a teacher, but mm -hmm. um, that their generation is a little bit different. And certainly, you know, things that when, when you and I started teaching that, that, you know, allowed us to connect with others within the building, right. maybe are a little bit different. Certainly things that now people utilize to connect aren't the same necessarily, or there's a lot of newer pieces there. Uh, where, where I'm going with this, I'm kind of curious, was there anything that, that you and Dr. Wilfong did as a part of this, this research that uncovered anything with these generational changes with the educators that we have in our schools today? You know, that's a great question. And it's, it's more uh, a question that Shelly and I have talked about hence because it comes up from time to time. It wasn't the intent to disaggregate in that manner when we went into it, probably because we just did not have the, um, we didn't have that in our windshield. Uh, however, as, as I work and you work and we all work with um, newer generation educators, they have this incredible, they have a way of being that's different than my circulatory system or hardwiring. Mm -hmm. They ask for what they want. They're candid about their needs. They have expectations for their principles. They are transparent with their colleagues in ways that I never was. And in, in a sense, that's healthy, right? probably completely yeah. healthy. And um, we, we may have been uh, um, missing some of the, the wisdom that they now have. 
Um, they, yeah. they, they certainly um, uh, invite principling to be a lot more mindful of the details of the human condition because they bring themselves to school. And they're not afraid to leverage that as part of their professional life. They they have this confluence of personal self and professional responsibility. Um, and and I'd, I'd say earlier in my career, I, I was more of a compartmentalization guy than yeah. confluence. And uh, no, we just didn't take the research in that direction. But certainly uh, for those who are coming after us with uh, research on mattering, it would be wonderful to disaggregate in many different ways than we did. Yeah, for sure. No, and I, I and I appreciate that. I think um, it is very interesting how you know each. Obviously, there's there are differences in each generation, and yeah. and certainly, you know, we're beginning to see that. And I, I like how you talked about that. I mean, it really is very much um, a a much greater awareness of self. Yes. Uh, certainly, a much greater ability to self advocate, yep. and to to just. I, I love how you said that have expectations of their principal. Uh, oh, because yeah. I, I think, you know, I, mean, I think back to like when I first started, I think, you know, I don't know that I had any expectations of my principal. Mm -hmm. Boy, I sure loved it when, when she stopped by or when she saw me in the hallway. Right. Because exactly. I just like, wanted to make my principal happy. Right. So, Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting <laughs> stuff. And, and, and certainly, stuff. you know, that, that takes me back to those, those first couple of years as a brand new teacher and, and, and the new book, um, uncommon sense for new teachers is all uh, about that. Like, like, how do you, how yeah. do you uncover? Yeah. And, and I'm just so curious about this because uh, we were talking here, you know, a, a week or two ago about about getting this this thing recorded, and you brought up this uncommon sense, and yeah, it makes so much sense, but it's not typically done. So no. talk a little bit about <laughs> uncommon sense for new teachers. Oh, gosh, yes. I've been wanting to write this one for like ever and a day. And where I really revved up, you had mentioned uh, your, your daughter. And uh, I got uh, my daughter now at Indiana State University. Um, she's starting this week as an RA, as a sophomore. And she's en route to being a middle high school math teacher. Okay, so, so my daughter, Caitlin, is just kicking it. And as she started her education professions class in high school, I became keenly aware that we've got we've got the next generation of students in really good hands with the next generation of teachers. But then what happened is, as many educational leadership profs are, we are borrowed down the hall or across university when there are leadership vacancies, especially when they're mid-year and, and the dean needs something. Or So I was down the hall chairing another department for a while for about four years actually before I was sent back to my my home here in ed leadership and it was the department of teaching and learning where they prepare new teachers right out of their bachelor's degree right and the faculty encouraged me to just jump right in and do some clinical supervision so I was going up and down in the classrooms of these these pre-service teachers and this is what I saw when you saw the facilitating teacher, the mentor teacher, knocking things out of the park, doing all the things that our best teachers do. As soon as that protege teacher, the pre-service teacher would take the reins, they would do all the things that those supervising teachers would do and they would do them well. But when you had the supervising teachers, like maybe not on their game as much, um, you know, a rolling of the eyes or maybe using sarcasm when it wasn't appropriate or whatever. As soon as the mini me would take over, right, our pre-service teacher, they would do exactly the same things. So I found myself having some really good necessary conversations with pre-service teachers. And they, again, it's about dignity. So dignity of the mentor teacher, dignity of the pre-service teacher. But I saw some stuff that I needed to write about. I, ne I had to get out in front of some of these issues. And so thinking about my daughter and talking to Caitlin, she helped me with topic development. Things are on her mind. So I think I may have shared with you that I'm a dance dad because I know you are a dance dad too, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. And so... Yeah. I just can't turn this stuff off. And I got to fess up. I was at a dance. This is the actual from 2018. I was at the Crawfordsville dance competition. And when your daughter dances, you're like on the bleachers, like riveting, you know, oh, yeah. it's like, it's a 
it's a beautiful experience, right? You're so proud of your daughter or son, yeah. right? Because, you know, all the kids are doing right. it. And um, yeah. but when I'm in the middle of it, yeah. this is what I'm doing, Darren. I'm holding up for our listening audience that I have this list on the back of this program of brainstormed book ideas. And so I was writing this book on the bleachers of a dance competition, thinking of my daughter who wants to be a teacher. And then it's a book about the way you approach life as a teacher, the way you think. And it's, it's, it's got topics like extracurricular horsepower, like the power and the energy of just being a coach or being a, um, a, a chaperone for an event that happens regularly or an advisor, um, talent scouting and cast management, how really your class, your classroom is a choreography opportunity. And there are kids in there who want to play certain roles and just leveraging the best cast management can, can elevate all the teaching and learning inside. Again, discipline is a teachable moment, hero making for parents. There's, Darren, there's ways you can sit alongside a parent and talk to their child and get them nodding with you and create the biggest ally in the world. But yeah. it's the way you think about things with uncommon sense, not just what you heard most of the people say most of the time. And so I have a 52 chapter book. Here it is for those in the viewing audience. Uncommon sense for new teachers just new out 52 chapters that can be read in any order. So what you can do and they take maybe 10, 15 minutes a piece at the most to read. So let's say you're having something like you're, you're wondering, OK, what could be a uh, my superpower as a teacher. I have a unit where I have about five or six chapters that talk all about your different superpowers as, as a teacher. Um, and, and one, by the way, um, that is between and among, whether it's in that or whether it's in your difference making unit is called delightfully different differentiation. Because we've heard of differentiated instruction, but I've got a way of delightfully differentiating that's different than most other folks are talking about it, and it'll just blow your mind. And so if I can have new teachers think about that uncommonly, oh, it's powerful, it's nuanced, and it can um, it can leverage some real learning in their class. So this this book has been a delight. And um, yeah. I did also reach out to some, some of the best pre-service educators at Indiana State University, a small group of them recommended by their professors. And I said, here's my list of topics. And they, they said, OK, I'd read that one. I'd read that one. I'd read that one. I would not read that one. I'd read that one. I said, well, why wouldn't you read this one? This this is some great stuff. And then I'd explain it. They go, yeah, that's great stuff. And and I said, well, why wouldn't you read it? They said, well, it's because of the title of your chapter. And I learned how to create titles of chapters based on what new teachers are thinking about and what they're hoping for yeah. and what they're worried about. I learned so much from those those newbies. And, and now with the books really um, the the three um, pre-service teachers who helped me the most with topic development, they're all first year teachers. So I'm going to be traveling around to their schools and giving a copy not only to them, but their mentor teacher. And I'm suggesting that these folks can read just one chapter a week for 52 weeks of the next year and take time to think about it uncommonly. Try some things on for size and read these things in any order. Uh, this This one's going to this one's going to just explode in terms of new teacher talent because it's it's what I'm calling the book to read before you decide what other books to read. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, it, it, as I was reviewing it, you know, certainly what what stood out to me two of my favorite chapters uh, back to back, um, what your students are not and yeah. what your students are. And oh it, it just touch on that really quick um, oh, I mean, without giving I away will. all the good stuff. Just, yep. just touch on, on what they are not and what they are. <laughs> what they are not. OK, how many times have we heard our friends and colleagues in the profession say, well, I work with this demographic or I work with this population. And because of such, oh, my goodness, that is so it's like sticking a pen in my eye in terms of deficit based thinking. Right. No, right. they're not. But what they are is they are somebody's most precious resource. They are powerful, agentic, incredible folks who have dreams and aspirations that we need to get on board with. So what I do with those two chapters is I juxtapose oftentimes how we refer innocently. Or it could have to do with some microaggressions we have. I have no idea. Could be yeah. biases we harbor, right? Maybe it yeah. is. But it's just so we can't talk like that anymore 
or or think and somebody's got to be the one to say don't use the term demographic because that is so it's just so wrong you know i mean talk about yeah. your students but we're teachers of students and people and and again every single student in our class is somebody's most precious resource and they are trusting us to care for them in the words we use matter there you go uh, you've heard me say it before yeah, everybody here listening to the show has heard me say it before we're in the people business right our job yeah. is to help this little person be a better little person and it's chemistry or biology or third grade or whatever our medium is but our job is to is to grow people. So I, I, I really love that. I'm glad that you were you were able to have 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 a minute or two to talk about that. That's some super powerful stuff. Mm. Oh man, Thank Ryan, you. unfortunately we're at that point in the show, right? Like um holy yeah. cow, our time is just flying by. <laughs> this is such an awesome conversation and we can keep going and going and going. But this is the part of the show where I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody on, okay. on the podcast. So this is the leaning into leadership podcast. So how are you leaning into leadership right now? Wow, that's cool. That's a great question. Darren, I am leaning into leadership by looking for leadership in all the quiet places. In all the quiet places. Um, I want to know, can the rhythm guitarist be the leader of the band? And I believe that there's a place for introverts in leadership. And the quiet ones are so knocking things out of the park when in leadership we take responsibility quietly for all that maybe didn't go right, um, but we give credit away for all the things that go well. Give it to the folks, give it to the staff, give it to the bus drivers, give it to the teachers, give it to the parents. My goodness, give it to the students. But I'm finding leadership more and more exists quietly. And with that quiet leadership comes power. Introversion is a little bit but many of us as educators are hardwired introverts, but uh, we don't have to put everything that we do uh, in a suit, on a stage, with a microphone, with charisma. Uh, there's some cool stuff as I lean into leadership that just happens. And um, potentially not too many people notice, but the result is what's powerful. Teachers are teaching, kids are learning, families have capacity, and our communities are better off. That's what I'm leaning into. Man, I love it. Oh, that's so that's so outstanding. Ah, so people are going to want to get in touch with you, Ryan. How do they find you? Social media, website. I mean, what what's the best way to connect with Ryan Donlin? Yeah, X is a good way to connect. I, I don't do a ton of social media, but uh, I have the old Twitter handle there, the X handle, and um, then uh, Ryan. Uh, Donlin dot com. www dot dot com is my website. Uh, we uh, have another website it's called minds unleashed from another book that i wrote with a friend of mine once upon a time um, but by and large just find me at indiana state i mean that's real easy because i'm on indiana state's uh email just about every day uh, at ryan.donlan at indstate.edu and if you want to grab my consulting email and get a hold of me or bring me to a, a town or schoolhouse near you it's dr short for donlan ryan at ryandonlin.com there we go we'll make sure we put all that stuff down in the show notes folks so you're not trying to frantically write it all down uh, <laughs> we'll make sure that that is all right there for you oh man ryan thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast man this has been an absolute blast it has been wonderful darren thank you you are uh you're you're a giant and i am just i'm trying to put on my track shoes to keep up with you <laughs> Oh, so please. thank you. Oh, come on thank now. You. Second most second most famous person in the history of Indiana State University behind Larry Bird. <laughs> That's right. Oh my goodness. Hey, we got the museum open now, by the way. Come come one, come all. Stay downtown. We are a destination event. There we go. Right on. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Darren. All right. As I said, really great stuff with Dr. Ryan Donlan. Make sure folks, you get down there in the show notes and hit all the links that are there. Go grab a copy of any of Ryan's books, especially that new one, Uncommon Sense for New Teachers. And make sure you get connected with Ryan as well. And now it's time for a pep talk. I want to lean into kindness with this particular pep talk. Uh, th this is something that I've been talking about a little bit periodically, but it's something that I want to continue to talk about because I think 
we currently live in such a divided world and you know we're going through so many challenging things and i mean let's just not without getting into politics let's talk about the political arena and how unkind that particular space is right now and how dividing it is no no matter where your politics are right it is just so dividing and i think the bulk of us here in our country we just want people to be a little bit nicer and it's really hard to just say hey go be nice it has to start with us right and i think when we lean in to being kind that's one of the most important things we can do so i want to share just a few ideas of things you can do as an individual to practice kindness, to model kindness, and hopefully to help others see that kindness taking place. And maybe they'll follow and emulate what you're doing. And the first one I want to talk about is just being present in conversations, right? Like put this thing down. I'm holding up my phone for those of you listening, put this thing down. And I am the most guilty of any person on the planet, but put the phone down, make eye contact and truly listen. It really lets the other person know that they genuinely matter, right? Second, lead with some empathy, right? Just try to see something from other people's perspectives. Empathy is not just, oh, I feel sorry for you. No, it's I am trying to see things from your perspective. So maybe even ask some questions to gain more information about their perspective. You know, we, we assume sometimes that we understand other people's perspectives, but maybe, just maybe ask right? That'll help you navigate some of those tough situations with a little bit more compassion. Okay. Third, practice appreciation on a regular basis, right? Just simple thank yous can really brighten another person's day, right? Whether it's somebody you work with or somebody in your family, just take some time to say thank you, right? Even if it's just for something simple, be intentional and say thank you. Right. Um, the next one, and this is what I'm working really hard on too, is practice patience and practice forgiveness. You know, it's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to respond in, in a negative way, but take that extra breath, really focus on some patience, focus on kindness. And you know what? Maybe a little bit of forgiveness, you know, uh, Odds are, if, if something was done that was negative, it probably wasn't done on purpose. And even if it was, you hanging on to it isn't changing the situation. Work on forgiving and letting that go. It's honestly a gift for both you and the person that you're forgiving. Um, and, and then the last one I'll tell you is, is be intentional with random acts of kindness. And, you know, the, one of my first memories of random acts of kindness was one time my wife and I, we'd, we'd only been married, I think maybe a year and we were at um, a pizza restaurant and the person came around um, and, and, you know, the, the waiter and I said, hey, you know, we'd like to get our check. And he said, oh, your check's already been paid. There was a couple in here earlier who saw you and said, hey, we just want to do a random act of kindness. And they picked up our tab and that has stuck with us for a long time. And it's something that, that occasionally we still do. We need to do it a little bit more frequently, I think. I think we need to get back to that. Uh, but even little things. You know, uh, my wife and I were walking into a store the other day and there was a gentleman loading balloons like for a party into the back of his car. And, and there was just no way he could get them all in there and it just wasn't working. And we had already walked past and I stopped and I said, Jess, come on, let's let, let's go back. And we went back and we helped this guy get all these balloons pushed into his car. It didn't take anything for us. It really didn't. It didn't take any time. It didn't take any effort. Right. But for him, I'm sure he was so grateful. And I would guarantee when he got home, he said, man, let me tell you about the nice, this, this nice husband and wife who helped me load balloons into the car, right? Just those simple random acts of kindness, right? When you see somebody who needs help, help them. It's so rare in our world today. So lean in and do that whenever you have the opportunity. I'm going to be very intentional with it. And I'm intentional today in challenging you to be intentional with kindness. That's what I've got for you this week, folks. Thanks so much for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Get out there.